Good morning. Welcome to our special episode of our webcast this month. We already had our monthly webcast. This is going to be a new product introduction webcast for the Crystal Craft Premier Square Cube machine. This will be course ID number ICE 1178. Today during this uh, webcast, we'll be introducing you to this new Square Cube, especially Cube machine. Uh, we're going to go through a few things and, and cover some different topics. Also, in order to make the webcast go a little bit better, we have muted everyone. And so we will have the ability to answer questions. If you have questions that come up right now on your screen, there should be an icon somewhere indicating there's a question and answer feature. You can open up this uh, sidebar here and you can type in these questions. So if uh, I'm not clear about something or if you have any specific questions, by all means, go ahead and put uh, a question in there. I do have Will York joining me today. He's going to produce this. He's going to be behind the camera and he'll be handling your questions. Thank you, Will. He uh, he never gets the screen time, but he's always behind the scenes for us. So uh, utilize that chat feature to uh, ask any questions that might come up during the course of this webcast. Also, at the end of the webcast today, just like we've been doing now for quite some time, there will be a quiz that you can take at the end of this webcast. Uh, it's not a pass fail quiz. We just want to make sure that we're presenting the information properly. We want you to be able to understand what we've covered as well. And so at the end of the webcast, there will be a QR code that will show up in the um, chat feature. And uh, I'm sorry, the QR code will show up on your screen, but we'll also put a link in the chat feature if you wanna take this quiz from your computer. Once you get done with the quiz, hit submit, put your email address in there. And for a reward for taking the quiz, you're not only going to get a, a uh, um, certificate of completion for attending the webcast, we'll also go ahead and reward you with a PDF version of the PowerPoint that we're doing today. All of these different slides that we have, you'll get those in a PDF so that you can go back and review them uh, if you need to in regards to that. So this is going to be a service webcast. As we go through the service webcast, we're going to give you the overview of this machine. We'll also go through the sequence of operation on this machine. What's it supposed to be doing and when it's supposed to be doing it? And then we'll get into the troubleshooting of this piece of equipment uh, at the end of the webcast. Now, for the overview, we have a special surprise today. We have our product manager for this line joining us. Cassie Johnson is a product manager for not only this line, but the undercounter lines and a couple of other things. And she's going to give us the overview of this piece of equipment. Cassie? Thanks, Jared, and good morning, everyone. So like Jared mentioned, I am the product manager for our new line of the Crystal Craft Premier. So I'm going to go over the overview today. So starting with the model and serial number location. Um, so with this, you're going to find these in two different parts of the machine. We have the rear, obviously, where we always have our data plate. And then also on this machine, you are going to find it on the inside. So right on the inside, you have the model and serial number. So it's very easy to access that in the front of the machine as well. So this is just an overview of that data plate. Um, some of the main information you're going to find on there. You have obviously the model and serial number. Very important um, if you're ever calling in for service to know where that serial number is, where you can locate it. Um, also the manufacturer date, the refrigerant charge, um, the voltage, country of uh, manufacture, and things like that can all be found on that data plate, on the inside of the machine, or on the back of the machine. Go over quickly how to read our model numbers. So at Manitowoc ICE, we do have smart model numbers. So everything in that model number does mean something. So this model number is the USE 0050A-161. So that U stands for undercounter, so it's an undercounter machine. S is our square cube. And then E is the refrigerant. So this one does use our 134A refrigerant. Um, the 50 in there designates about how many pounds of production the machine makes. So it makes about 50 pounds of ice per 24 hours at that 90, 70 um, temperature. And then the voltage of 161 at the end of that model number. Next, going through component identification. Um, so this is just showing from the front of the machine, as you can see here, or on the screen, we have, um, we go back to the door handle, which is unique to this machine. And then if we go through the um, inside of the machine, kind of go through some of the components on the inside here. So we do have the user interface or the touchpad membrane. Um, you can see here the bin also full of ice. Uh, we have the water trough, um, the floats, and then also on this machine, a little bit different um, than other ones, we do have the tongs and tongs holders. So that makes it very easy to reach in and you're able 
to um, take a single piece of ice there and then put it into your beverage. Oh, and then one thing, sorry, I forgot to mention here is we do have this water filter down here. So it does have an integrated water filtration system. So this does really help to ensure that the ice is coming out crystal clear every time. I guess we'll leave this open and go to the next slide. Um, and this is kind of going over more so this user, user interface. So here, um, make it easy, power button we have here. We have the ice delay, which Jared will go into a little bit um, later on how that feature works. We have um, the clean button, so very easy to set a cleaning cycle with that. And then our um, water filter reset and then service button there as well. So this next slide goes over the evaporator. Um, so you can't see it here. So um, if you look on the slide, you can see how the evaporator looks on this machine. It's a little bit different than any other type of evaporator system that Manitowoc Ice has made. So it combines two different evaporators. It uses a traditional pan-shaped evaporator like you would see on our cube machines, and then also a pin-shaped evaporator. And so with these two evaporators, we're able to control the amount of refrigerant to each evaporator individually. And so that results in those fully formed cubes. So you have the pin-shaped evaporator that's freezing the ice from the inside out and then the pan shaped evaporator is freezing from the um, outside in and so that results in your fully formed uh, crystal clear square cubes um, also have the water inlet valve you can see on that and then um, the evaporator cutting grid which helps to um, make sure those cubes are those square uh, formed So component identification going on, you can see um, what the front and the side view look like. And then on the next slide, this is what it looks like if you have that x-ray vision. So if you can see through the machine, um, this is what it looks like on the inside. So there you can see how everything's kind of laid out with the evaporator on the top and then the uh, refrigeration system down below. And then in the middle there is where that bin area would be um, for the ice. So this kind of just shows a quick overview of all the components inside the machine. You can see from the evaporator, dump belt, curtain switch, float switches, water pump, compressor, where that's located, where the water filter, the harvest valve, and the water inlet valve is located on this machine. A little bit closer view of the evaporator and um, the components there. Um, you can see here, this is that left side view, so you can see where the evaporator is. Um, and the control board, the water pump, water trough, and everything there from that left side view. And the back view of the machine as well. Um, so you can see the components that you can um, are located on the back side of the machine. Okay, and then the other thing I wanted to mention is we do have an optional drain pump um, accessory that's available with this machine. And so this is used in those situations where there might not be a floor drain nearby. So we do have an optional drain pump accessory. Um, so this is the K00516. Um, and another accessory we do offer with this machine is our left um, door hinge kit. And so this does come with a right door hinge, but if that doesn't work in um, the particular situation, you can get a kit to convert it to the other side. And so just to quickly review what we went over, we went over the overview. Um, we went where the data plate is located and what information is on that data plate, the model number, how to read the model number, and then we went through component identification, and then finally that optional drain pump kit. So now I'm gonna turn it back over to Jared. Thank you, Cassie. Uh, much appreciated for going over the overview. It was her product. We decided to give her an opportunity to uh, show you what it looked like and, and kind of come over cover some of the overview stuff. So now we'll get into the service end of it. Uh, we're going to talk about the sequence of operation. The sequence of operation from a service standpoint is always very vital, right? Because let's face it, if we don't know what that machine is supposed to be doing or when it's supposed to be doing it, we're going to have a tough time figuring out what's wrong with it. So we're going to get into the ice making sequence of operation. We'll get going. OK, 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 here we go. So here's the user interface again, as we talked about the power button. We will utilize a curtain switch and a bin level thermistor in this unit. The bin switch is gonna, uh, curtain switch, bin switch, is gonna help us not only with the harvest, but maybe even shut the machine off if necessary. But we'll really rely more on the bin thermistor for when we're shutting down a full bin. When we initially push the power button, we have to make sure that the uh, curtain switch is closed. There's no ice making contact with that bin thermistor in order for this machine to want to make ice. 
on our control circuit, on our control board, we do have our two sides of our control board. We've got our, our input side, the low voltage control side of our control board, and we've got our line voltage side as well with the outputs. The outputs are gonna be relays on the board, which are responsible for sending the voltage out to all of the line voltage components. There's also going to be with the optional drain pump, uh, if uh, as Cassie mentioned, if you're gonna utilize the drain pump, if for some reason that drain pump can't pump that water, it fills up, there's nowhere for the water to go. It does plug into the control board to tell the board, we better stop, we can't get rid of this water. Uh, it'll get its power from the machine initially, but there will be a, a safety in there to shut the unit down in the event that the drain pump is not able to pump. Maybe the hose got plugged or something along those lines. Also, uh, as, as Cassie was mentioning with the delay, we can place a delay into this machine uh, by uh, pushing the delay button. Now the machine does, needs to be on in the ice making cycle, but then you can push the uh, ice delay button. Pushing it once will highlight the number two. You're gonna put it into a two hour delay, push it again, it'll go to four, push it again, it'll go to eight. Uh, and then if you push it again, it'll go back to, to not having any of these. We have also added a repeat daily delay to this unit as well. Uh, this is a, a premium cube, it's, it's a craft cube. And so uh, as the ice is made that's sitting in the bin, unfortunately it is dying that slow, horrible death as it slowly melts. And so uh, the customer may decide they want to delay it at night and uh, have it sit off overnight so that in the morning it starts making that fresh ice again so that they've got those crystal clear cubes and, and we're not just having ice sit in a bin slowly melting. And then that way we could do that by doing a repeat delay by holding the delay button for three continuous seconds when you've highlighted whatever hour delay you want. So maybe they would select the eight uh, hour delay in the evening so it sits off most of the night and comes back on in the morning. So that would uh, be a feature that they could utilize on that delay. In order to get out of the delay, let's say they got busy and, and they're starting to run low, they need the machine to run even though they're on a delay, simply pushing the power button to turn the machine off and then turn it, <coughs> pushing the power button again to turn it back on would bypass that delay and start that machine up. So <coughs> sequence of operation, we do have to turn the machine on by pushing the power button. Uh, also the bin level thermostat or the bin thermistor must not have any ice making contact to it and the bin switch, curtain switch must be closed before the machine will start making ice. Once we push the power button, the blue LED will uh, light up on the control and now we're energizing our water pump will energize the dump valve and the harvest valves. This is a 15 second water purge. Look, like it or not, ice is a food. Anytime we start these machines up from a stop, we only wanna have clean, fresh water in that machine. So we'll always energize water pump and dump valve to get make sure there's nothing in that water trough, get it down the drain so that when we do go to make the ice, we're gonna bring in clean, fresh water to do that. Also, we'll energize the harvest valves to kind of equalize the refrigeration pressure. So we call it the water purge. We could almost call it the water purge slash equalization process within that refrigeration system. Once we've done that, we'll enter into our pre-chill. The water inlet valve will energize. It's gonna be looking for information from both of the float switches. We're looking for information from the harvest float switch and from the high float or the ice thickness float. Liquid line solenoid valve will be energized. Compressor contactor will energize. That'll bring uh, voltage over to the compressor. The condenser fan motor will have a fan cycle switch in it. So the fan may or may not be running. The pre-chill is gonna last for 30 seconds plus. It's also looking for the high float to be satisfied. We need to make sure we've got a full water trough as we're filling that up uh, and get that uh, uh, ample pre-chill. Helps us a little bit with slushing and gets the evaporator cold uh, so that when we do start to spray the water up onto that evaporator, we can start uh, chilling that water down quickly uh, to be able to make ice with it. Once we've satisfied the ice thickness float switch, uh, the water solenoid valve will de-energize on that unit to turn off the incoming water. On the pre-chill, again, we wanna make sure we've got all the water we need in order to make a sheet of ice or, or a, a batch of ice, I guess. We're not making sheets here, we're gonna make a batch. So now we're gonna go into the freeze cycle. The official beginning of the freeze cycle is when the water pump energizes. We'll start spraying that water. 
up onto the evaporator grid with that refrigeration system running because the compressor contactor coil is still energized, liquid line solenoid valves energized. We do have a minimum freeze time of the first freeze cycle of 15 minutes. This is going to be a dual freeze circuit, as Cassie had pointed out. We're going to freeze from the outside in and from the inside out. So there's going to be two different freeze cycle circuits on this machine in order to get that square cube. The middle of the cube is always the hardest to fill because it's the furthest away from our refrigeration system and those pins help us uh, freeze that cube from the inside out. Uh, liquid line solenoid valve is going to be energized for the first freeze cycle on this uh, unit. As we're in that freeze cycle, we have to again minimum of 15 minutes. There is a 45 minute maximum freeze time for it uh, on this initial freeze cycle. If we hit 45 minutes of freeze time, uh, we'll go ahead and move on to the second uh, stage of that freeze. But what we're really looking for is there's a thermistor uh, on the uh, suction line in behind that evaporator. And uh, once it hits 10 degrees Fahrenheit, it's going to tell the control board that freeze cycle number one is complete. It's time to move on to the second stage of our freeze. Water pump remains energized. Compressor contactor remains energized. But now we're going to turn off the liquid line solenoid valve to take away that first stage freeze cycle and put all that refrigerant into our second stage, into the pin stage of the freeze cycle. We're going to again have the pan and the pan, two different circuits. Uh, but we, we want to be able to freeze all the way through that cube inside out and outside in on these. So that de-energizing the liquid line solenoid valve redirects all the flow to our pins so that we can start finishing out those cubes to get that square shape that we want on that square cube. Uh, on the fr second freeze cycle, again, we do have a minimum of a 15 minute uh, free cycle. We cannot go into harvest before that 15 minute min uh, minimum has been met. And then we'll have a maximum freeze time of 60 minutes on the second freeze cycle. So after 60 minutes, we still haven't uh, determined it's time to go into harvest. We're going to go into harvest based on time. What we're looking for to go into the harvest cycle is we're going to convert all of the water in the water trough to ice on, on that evaporator grid. So it's going to be a batch water system. It's going to work a lot like our cool air line and our NEO under counter line. So if you're familiar with working on those units, you're, you're going to be fairly familiar with the control circuit in this uh, under counter square cube machine because we'll utilize the float switches pretty much the same way as we do with cool air and NEO. So the amount of water in the water trough will directly correlate with how thick or how big these square cubes are going to get. And we can adjust that a little bit if necessary. Once we've converted all that uh, water in the trough to ice on the evaporator grid, this allows our harvest float switch to close and tell the control board we've now converted all the water in the water trough to ice up on the evaporator grid. Let's go ahead and initiate the harvest cycle. As we go into harvest cycle, there'll be a 45 second water purge. We want to get rid of whatever mineral laden water we have left over at the end of that cycle. Get it down the drain, get it away from that machine. So the dump valve will be energized with the water pump. We'll also or, uh, energize the harvest valves, both the pan and the pin harvest valves. We're going to be looking for information from the curtain switch to tell us that the ice is coming off the evaporator grid. We do need to move hot gas through the refrigeration system so the compressor remains energized by keeping the contactor coil energized and having that refrigeration system running. As we go through it, we do have a maximum of a seven minute harvest cycle on this machine. But as we start to see that ice drop off, uh, it's going to drop off the single cubes. We've also got a cutting grid uh, on the outside edge of that evaporator pan. This cut grid is going to utilize that hot gas to get rid of the bridge. All right, there'll be just a little bit of bridge as we go into harvest. We want to melt that bridge off so we don't have those little lumps on the end like we do on our traditional cubed ices. Uh, or ice the cubes, so it's going to square out that cube by, by warming up the cutting grid. We'll also warm up the pan and the pan so that the ice can release and drop down into the bin. As that first cube releases from the evaporator grid, it's going to knock the water curtain open. It'll cause that water curtain to open and close, activating that curtain switch, indicating that the ice is starting to come off the evaporator grid. Once we see that, we'll start a 60 second timer to finish that harvest cycle. Once that first cube comes off, we can get the other cubes off within 60 seconds. And once we've seen that initial uh, curtain switch activation, uh, the control board will then 
do a 60 se um, 60 second uh, time down to to tell it that it's time to terminate the harvest cycle on that unit. If we've terminated the harvest cycle after 60 seconds and the curtain switch is closed and there's no ice contact in the uh, bin thermostat, well, you know what? We've got some more room to put some more ice. Let's go ahead and go back and make another sheet of ice or another batch of ice going back to the pre-chill. Again, 30 seconds plus the high float. We'll keep doing that clear up until the point that ice is making contact with the thermistor or ice gets caught and is holding open the water curtain. Either one of those will shut this machine down on a full bin. It's an either or or both. It doesn't matter. So going back through those timers a little bit, these are non-adjustable control timers. Our pre-chill timer has a maximum of five minutes, but remember, we just need a 30 second pre-chill with uh, uh, satisfying the high water level float switch on the freeze cycle, 15 minute minimum on the First free cycle, 45 minute maximum. The second free cycle or the pin cycle is going to be a 15 minute minimum and a 60 minute maximum. And then our harvest timer, maximum of seven minutes. But again, it'll look for the curtain switch to activate and start that 60 second timer to finish out the harvest. Once we do shut the machine off on a full bin, there will be a three minute delay for restart to allow the refrigeration system to re uh, rest before we go in and restart that again. So. Uh, that three minute delay for restart will be there anytime we shut this unit off. What happens if the power goes out in the middle of the uh, ice making cycle? Maybe the power uh, got interrupted or something. And when the machine comes back on at a power interruption, we will come back on in a soft harvest. All right, we're going to soft start the harvest cycle because it is a batch water system. So we'll go ahead and initiate the, the refrigeration system with the harvest valves energized. During a soft uh, restart, the um, the flat the power button will be flashing, indicating that we are in that soft startup and that uh, harvest cycle. So we can clear the evaporator to make sure that there was no ice on the evaporator, so that we can restart at the beginning uh, of a, a cycle to make sure that we've got the proper amount of water in that water trough to make the ice that we want to make on that. We've also got some service limits uh, installed with this machine. Uh, service limit number one is a long freeze cycle. It's the same as it's always been uh, ever since we introduced a control board to our machines, clear back in the B model. Service limit number one means we've exceeded our maximum freeze time for consecutive cycles. Our service limit number two is the same as it's always been. Service limit number two means we've exceeded our maximum harvest cycle for consecutive cycles. And in these, each of these cases, if we do that three times in a row, something's wrong. But just like we do with Neo and Cool Air with the batch float system and the, and the batch water system, we have our service limit number three, which is our water loss or no water safety or, or service limit. We know we can't make ice without water. And so if we do see a situation where the ice thickness float switch and the harvest float switch are not changing state within the first four minutes of pre-chill, we don't have any water in that machine. So we can't make ice without it. Why bother? Let's shut down on a service limit number three. If we do shut off on service limit number three, there will be a 30 minute delay. The machine will restart once again, looking for information from the float switches. Maybe the water got briefly interrupted. It got turned back on, at which point the machine would go ahead and go back into normal ice making. Uh, there's a limit of a 100 times that the machine will try to restart on a service limit number three before it's a hard um, lockdown. Get your new water filter, get the water turned back on, whatever the case might be. We've also got a, a service limit number four. If you do have the optional uh, drain pump installed in the machine, if that high float switch, remember, if, if that float switch tells the control board that I can't pump the water out, maybe the line's kinked or something like that, it's going to shut down on service limit number four saying, hey, I can't get that drain pump cleared out. And so we need to get that line cleared or whatever rectified in order for the uh, unit to continue operating. And then we've got a full bin fault for service limit number five. If the curtain switch stays open for 20 or 48 hours, that's two days, uh, we're gonna do a service limit number five. Something's wrong, maybe the switch isn't closed uh, or maybe something else is interfering with the curtain to open and close to shut down. Again, as we were talking about, uh, just like the Neo or the cool air, we can increase or decrease how big these cubes are to a point. 
if we want a little bit uh, bigger cubes, we're going to raise the, the ice thickness float switch up a little bit. Remember, the amount of water correlates directly with how much ice we end up with on the evaporator. And so if we want thicker ice, we're going to increase the water in that water trough by raising the uh, ice thickness float switch up. If we want a little bit thinner cube or a little bit smaller cube, we're going to lower that down. There's a couple of little clips on the front, just like Neo does in order to raise or lower the water level to make those ice cubes a little bit bigger or a little bit smaller, depending on what the customer prefers at that location. All right, so we've already went through that. On the uh, uh, 134A system, as, as Cassie pointed out, we will stay with 134A refrigerant in this uh, unit and in this refrigeration system. All of our ice machines are critically charged. And so it's very important not to access this system unless you absolutely have to because of that critical refrigeration charge. So I know it's a little bit busy, but we do have that two stage refrigeration circuit. So we'll kind of show you a little bit here as we're going. So we do have the two harvest valves here. We've got two expansion valves, one for each of these circuits. There's going to be a pin circuit and there's going to be a pan circuit. Remember, we're doing two different free cycles from the inside out and from the outside in in order to get that square cube. The liquid line solenoid valve feeds our pan circuit. So once we've got the ice formed in the evaporator around the outside edges, we'll de-energize that for the free cycle number two. But in the meantime, during the free cycle number one, both expansion valves are feeding because the liquid line solenoid valve is energized. We will have an accumulator in there well as well because of the amount of refrigerant we're moving. We don't want to slug the compressor with any liquid. Our air condenser is going to be there and we'll store a little bit of extra refrigerant in the receiver as well on this unit. As we go into the second free cycle, we're going to de-energize. Remember that liquid line solenoid valve. We're going to take the refrigerant now away from the pan circuit and send it all to the pin circuit so we can finish those cubes out from the inside out, because that's the hardest place to freeze is the middle of those cubes. So we'll allow this, this pin circuit only to get that refrigerant during the second stage of our uh, freeze cycle. When we go into harvest, we're gonna utilize a hot gas defrost, just like we do on uh, all of our self-contained air, water, and traditional remote units. We're gonna allow this high temperature, high pressure vapor from the compressor at discharge gas to go through our harvest valves. We're going to energize both harvest valves and allow the refrigerant to warm up that evaporator, give up that sensible heat to melt that bond between the, sheet, the ice and the evaporator grid so that those cubes can release during the harvest cycle. Also, that cutter, that remember the cutting part of the grid, this is also going to have a refrigerant tube wrapped around it. And it's going to allow it to warm that up and, and be able to square off those cubes and get rid of what little bridge might be on the face of that evaporator during the harvest cycle. All right, on the uh, critically charged system, we're going to be utilizing again our 134A. This is going to um, operate on our pressures a little bit differently depending on uh, what our ambient condition is. So we do have our, our freeze and harvest cycle pressures uh, published in our technician's handbooks. Uh, what, what you can expect to see in regards to our, our, our freeze and harvest cycle pressures, because it is 134A, we're going to see a lot lower head pressure in the freeze cycle. We are going to use expansion valves, so unlike a capillary tube system, we'll see a little bit higher suction pressures uh, in, in the freeze and in the harvest cycle than we would in a, in a standard cap tube system with 134A. All right, <coughs> so that's the sequence of operation. That's what the machine is supposed to be doing when it's supposed to be doing it. We talked about that. We're going to talk. We talked about how to adjust the uh, weight and also the refrigeration system on this unit, how we're going to utilize it in two stages of the freeze cycle in order to be able to freeze at a uh, big solid cube. OK, we're going to go ahead and talk about uh, troubleshooting on troubleshooting this ice machine. If we've got a machine that won't run, First thing we can do is double check, make sure it's plugged in, make sure the unit is on. We can take a look at the line voltage on the control board uh, on our number 39 and 32 wires. We can also verify that we've got a good fuse. 
on that control board by measuring for voltage across that fuse. Verify that the power button is working. Oh, by the way, if any of the LEDs are lit up on the control board or on that user interface, you can skip the first two steps. You've got power to the machine and the fuse is good. So let's make sure it's just not turned on. Is it maybe in a delay? Is one of the delay lights lit if the machine isn't running and we think it should be? Push the power button, it should go to a solid blue, indicating that the machine has been turned on. Verify also, we do have our test mode button on the control board, just like we do with Neo and Cool Air. And with our Indigo and Indigo Next lines, we have the ability to uh, do a test mode. We're gonna push and hold that button for three seconds. This is gonna energize and send us into our test mode. What's gonna happen? We'll energize all of the relays on the control board uh, at the same time, we'll also illuminate all of the LEDs on the control board and on the user interface. It's gonna tell us whether or not we've got uh, good con um, <clears throat> communication between the, uh, the touchpad, the user interface, and, <clears throat> and if the relays are, are truly sending voltage out to the line voltage components. This will last for two minutes. After the two minute test mode, uh, the machine will actually go into a display bypass Let's say, for instance, we do have a failed touchpad. The power button's just not working, but the machine is working. We're going to need to get a new touchpad in that unit. So by entering into the test mode, after that two-minute test mode, <clears throat> the machine will go into a, a, um, a uh, touchpad or user interface bypass and allow the machine to make ice normally uh, up to about 500 cycles. This is a better part of a week maybe even a little bit longer, giving us sufficient time as service technicians to go out, get, get a new user interface, come back and install it on that machine in the event that it has failed. Also, if you've entered into the test mode, but everything is working, you can exit the test mode at any time simply by pushing the test mode button again. That tells the control board, I'm done with the test mode. I don't need to do it anymore. So pushing the button a second time would terminate that test mode. Okay, so we got to make sure the curtain switch is, is functioning properly. We can look at the curtain switch LED on the control board and, and make sure that the water curtain is not only in place, but is closed. Double check the magnet, make sure the magnet is on that uh, water curtain as well. We can ohm out that curtain switch if necessary. Uh, open and close, that's what the control board's looking for. We want to be able to open and close that curtain switch. Maybe the bin thermistor is, is uh, open and it's causing really low temperatures. And so we want to make sure that the thermistor is giving the control board proper information. We can ohm it out, uh, verify what temperature the thermistor is actually uh, seeing on that bin thermostat. So we get a, uh, um, a temperature probe, one that can actually handle a curved line. All right, and we're gonna get that temperature. We're gonna see what the resistance is from that bin thermostat back to the control board, find out what that temperature is on that thermistor, and then we can check inside the technician's handbook to see if that range is where it needs to be from the thermistor. If not, we can replace that thermistor to resolve that issue. If it is, then uh, that uh, potentially is not gonna be the issue. So if you've gone through all of these steps, if you've got a machine that cannot run or isn't running, uh, we should be able to resolve that Remember, we do have the drain pump as well that could keep the machine off on our service limit number four uh, and, and other things. So keep that in mind as, uh, as we troubleshoot a machine that may not be functioning. Okay, what if we're going into uh, or having a machine that's running, 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 and maybe it's going off on a service limit number one. It's not going into the harvest cycle. We can test it the same way that we were testing our float switches with the Neo and Cool Air. They work and, and function exactly the same way. The harvest float switch in the down position is the normally closed set of contacts. The harvest float switch in the up position is going to be the normally open set of contacts. It's just like the curtain switch. This is a switch. Open and closed are the only two acceptable positions for these switches. If you read anything in between those, get a new switch. You shouldn't be reading anything when it's open. And you should be reading pretty much within a, a one ohm of continuity with those switches in the down or the closed position. All right, as the water trough is going down, the, the low float will close. That's going to tell the control board that we've converted all the water in the water trough to ice on the evaporator grid. That's 
uh, the indication to the control board it's time to initiate a harvest cycle. If the board cannot see that uh, flow switch close, it's not going to know that it needs to go into a harvest cycle. We'll end up on a service limit number one and probably really, really thick ice uh, on the evaporator grid. So that's how we'll test that um, harvest float switch. If we're maxing out on the first cycle, let's look at our evaporator thermistor. Remember the end of the free cycle one stage is when the evaporator thermistor hits 10 degrees Fahrenheit or less. That tells the control board that, okay, the outside pan, we've got a good layer of ice there. It's time to initiate that second stage of free cycle in order to fill in the middle of those. And if the control board's not seeing that and we're maxing out on the first stage of that free cycle, maybe the evaporator thermistor uh, is shorted and it's reading too high of a temperature. And so the control board doesn't know it's time to go into the second stage of the harvest cycle. Just like we did with our bin level thermistor, we can verify, get a, a, a thermometer that's capable of measuring a round line and uh, get that temperature, ohm out the evaporator thermistor, see what kind of resistance we have. And just like with the uh, bin level thermistor, the evaporator thermistor, we've got the chart. This is what range we should be reading in a K ohm range in order to verify that the resistance is proper on the, uh, for the control board to continue into the second stage of our free cycle. So we'll do that by ohming it out uh, on the K ohm range, as I mentioned before. What if we are not going into harvest? We've got the full sheet of ice built up, the water pump might be cavitating, all of the water's gone. We can go ahead and initiate and, and verify and see why we're not going into the harvest cycle. In this case, we could probably end up with the service limit number one as well. If we're not going into the harvest cycle, maybe we, uh, are seeing that uh, harvest float switch closed. I just realized I did that backwards. I, I was doing, I was talking about not going into harvest during the going into premature harvest section. And so uh, I apologize for that. But uh, so <clears throat> rather than go back, I'm just gonna admit my mistake. So we've already went through that, but we're gonna back up just a little bit in regards to the premature harvest. If the flow switch is stuck closed, it's gonna be going into that premature harvest. And in that case, we would see a service limit number two, and we would be uh, maxing out on the harvest time. But in this case, if we're not going into the harvest cycle, we would be off on a service limit number one, meaning that we're in um, seeing uh, the maximum freeze time because the control board wouldn't know it's time to go into the uh, freeze cycle, but we'll, uh, or the harvest cycle. But in this case, since I did it backwards, uh, I, I don't, I really don't, uh, I don't know, I'm a little confused right now, but this is my first day here. So uh, hope, you, hope you'll bear with me. But uh, anyway, we're gonna go back. We're still troubleshooting the same way, even though I did them backwards. We're going to be looking to see if we're reading the proper resistance. Are we getting the proper voltage to the harvest valves? Uh, and um, maybe it is going into harvest. We're just not seeing the harvest valve energizing uh, from that control circuit. We can make sure we're getting that voltage all the way out to the harvest valve. In this case, the board did go into the harvest cycle. It's just not making the harvest valves energize, or maybe the voltage isn't quite getting to it. Maybe the harvest valve itself is not opening. So we can verify the pressures. Again, we're gonna be very careful about um, going into a um, situation where the um, we need to put refrigeration gauges onto the unit. And so we, we wanna be careful there, but sometimes we're gonna to have to if we've gone through all these steps and we're gonna be able to make sure that we're um, troubleshooting and, and engaging up at the right times because uh, frankly, a majority of ice machine problems tend to be water related or cleaning related on these units. So now I'm really confused, but uh, that's OK. <laughs> if we're going into a harvest cycle prematurely, uh, maybe the float switch is giving the control board bad information. Maybe the float switch is uh, stuck closed. In this case, if the float switch is stuck closed, we've also got our service limit number three as well. Uh, there are no water or water loss safety. And so it might be possible that that float switch being stuck closed, but we are looking for both float switches for our service limit number three. And so if the, the high float is actually functioning, uh, maybe the, the low float or the harvest float is stuck closed. This is gonna create a, a premature harvest situation because the control board will still see that water level in the water trough. So 
in that case, we could double check that uh, low float, make sure it is uh, indeed closing when it's down and opening when it's up. It should only be closed in the down position. Maybe it's getting hung up. Verify, make sure that harvest float switch opens and closes properly on that control circuit. We can also, um, if we're going into a premature harvest, remember we do have minimum freeze time timers of 15 minutes for both the free, first freeze and the second freeze cycle. And so if we're going into harvest right after 15 minutes, we might might be in an ambient condition that allows that. But if we're not really filling in the cubes very well, then in that case, maybe the thermistor is indeed telling the control board to go into the second freeze cycle on the back of the evaporator prematurely because it might be reading too cold and that's causing the control board to not keep that refrigeration circuit long enough on that uh, pan circuit. So that uh, evaporator thermistor would be responsible for that. We can own that out again. We do have the resistance chart on the uh, in the technician's handbook. Uh, well, and you'll also get it at the end of the webcast. If you take the quiz and submit it, uh, you'll have this PDF version and have those uh, resistance charts as well. Our technician's handbooks are already available uh, for download from our website or off of easy ports. Uh, we should have the printed versions uh, before too long through the, the distributor fulfillment center if you want the printed version of the Crystal Craft Premier technician's handbook. So that's the troubleshooting. We went through an ice machine that wouldn't run, machine that would not go into the, the harvest cycle, and if we're going into a premature harvest cycle again, it's going to be very familiar to how we troubleshoot the Neo line and the cool air line because we use the float switch system on those machines as well. And the troubleshooting is exactly the same in regards to those water float switches. So service training update. We've also got some modules set up on this Crystal Craft Premier USE 50 machine. Uh, you can go in and take little bits and pieces. You can see the overview. We can look, go over the installation of the equipment, the cleaning and sanitizing uh, of the units, the preventative maintenance, and uh, the sequence of operation, then some troubleshooting as well. These are just short little modules that you can take at your own pace. There's no charge for them. They're all available at manitowocice.com under service and under training on our online technical training. We're going to talk a little bit more. We're going to cover on the cleaning and sanitizing. I wanted to make sure that everybody knew this is going to be a copper evaporator that's nickel plated. So during the cleaning and sanitizing, we will utilize the nickel safe ice machine cleaner on the USC 50 machine. All right, because it is a nickel plated evaporator. It's going to give us a lot more longevity of the evaporator. It helps us transfer the heat really well. So on the Crystal Craft Premier, we are going to utilize nickel safe cleaner because it is a copper nickel plated evaporator, which also we would use our sanitizer during the cleaning and sanitizing of this piece of equipment. So there we go. We made it through the service webcast. We want to thank everybody for attending today. I would really like to thank Will for producing this and handling the camera and all of that. Big thanks to Cassie, our product manager for this line as well, for coming in and giving us the overview and introduction to this machine. It's now time to take our quiz. You should see a QR code right now in your screen. You can use your smartphone to scan that and go right to the quiz. And we'll also put a link in the chat feature under the uh, live uh, team live event. You can click on that if you're uh, enjoying from your computer. Take the quiz submit it. There's no pass or fail. You can get them all wrong. You're still going to get your seminar certificate and a copy of today's presentation, but take that quiz. We thank everybody for attending today. Cassie tells me that these units should start shipping within the next week or two. So those of you that are already expecting to see them, you should be seeing them before too long, uh, but thanks for coming today. I hope everybody has a great day and we'll see you next time.